This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. It turns out the culture is saying we don't want any macho men. The term is toxic masculinity and it seems to be gaining momentum. Well, what does the Bible say about men being men? We're going to talk with a pastor who's researched the origin. But first, how would you feel about attending a church that calls itself the First Heavy Metal Church of Christ? This group in Dayton, Ohio has been growing for the past few years despite its unorthodox image. Well, I got a chance to sit down with Pastor Brian Smith and ask him about his one-of-a-kind church. Our church is a Trojan horse and nothing more. You know, it's like I come again from the, you know, Assemblies of God Christian Life Center, but this template lets us get into the places where other churches can't. We go to secular rock concerts, we go to bars and, and bike shows and car shows and put our hot rod bus up and people just flock to it. It's amazing. So how is it today? I mean, the, the proof is in what's been happening at that church. Yeah, the, I'm sorry. I, I was just saying the proof is in what's been happening inside the walls of that church is you're baptizing people and people are getting saved. and, mm -hmm. and uh, Who's coming alongside of you now? Are there pastors? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we've had great Baptist pastors preach at our church, Pentecostal. The people that truly know us and mm -hmm. have gotten to know us and taken the time to read our What We Believe page and then, you know, have followed us. I mean, we've had over 900 baptisms in the river wow. in eight years. We've had over 20 atheists and agnostics come to Christ at this church. So nobody can ever tell me it's not of the Holy Spirit. And even if the church shut its doors tomorrow, um, that's a Holy Spirit freak of nature. So yeah. the local churches that know us has come along beside us. They know we're legit. But I get hate mail or hate comments all the time. We are um, out of the norm. Uh, I just got just slammed. A oh, just a touch. I got slammed this last uh, Sunday for, I mean, a very hardcore sermon I preach talking about how I feel the American church has gotten lazy and a lot of the uh, legalism and the, and the Christians that give Jesus a bad name that our people are in hell because of that right now. Oh. And hell is for eternity. And it's like, I almost feel as we as American Christians, first world Christians don't believe in hell like we say we do because we're so, a lot of the church is so lazy and passive and they treat the church mm -hmm. like it's a members only country club with no outreach programs and no, you know, mm -hmm. anything like that. So I personally think when somebody gets saved, they need to go to hell for one minute <laughs> and they will come back the greatest evangelist ever. And then instead of trying to shove Jesus down people's throats and point out their flaws, yeah. they would beg them to accept Christ because they don't want their loved ones going to hell. Now, and, and so in your sermon, somebody walks into your church and uh, they're living a life of sin, whatever you want to define that as. It may be obvious, may not be obvious. You don't preach fire and brimstone. You said you preach it with a tone of love. Well, how, I, does that, how does that love come through? Well, here's the deal. Like right now with the tone in my voice, I could just about tell you anything right now mm -hmm. um, with this tone. Now, we do preach hell and repentance because that's a, that's a necessity. Mm -hmm. It's real. You have to repent and be born again, and you cannot continue on sinning. Okay, so we do preach that, but I'm, I speak it like I'm talking to you right mm -hmm. now. And as Christians, we need to understand that somebody that's been out in the world all of their lives, when they meet Jesus... We can't sit there and start a, an hourglass and sit there, okay, now, yeah. let's see how long it's going to take for this guy to it's clean up. Yeah. A lot of the times they will quit the stuff in their, li in their lives that they know is wrong on their own power, mm -hmm. and then they will fail because it's in their own power. And then the church will come. We're the only army in the world that shoots its wounded or kills its yeah. wounded. And we need to get out of the way and just preach the truth in love. Mm -hmm and let the Holy Spirit clean these people up. And that could be a lifelong process. Yeah. Well, somebody looks at your church, First Heavy Metal Church, you're, an, you're a rocker. I'm not gonna say you're an old rocker, you're a rocker. Lead singer, uh, if, if I come into that church, am I gonna be able to understand the words of the music when you start worshiping? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> or is it gonna be a lot of... No, people automatically think, think because of the name that Cannibal sure. Corpse is playing for praise and worship or blah and all that stuff. That's further from the truth. Actually, the name means armor of God. Mm -hmm. So that, and then we took it and put some Iron Maiden font to the name of the church and then put that on the side of a hot rod black church bus. But at the end of the day, it's armor of God. But when we bring in a different worship band every week, so that ranges from blues 
to uh, rock, but not too heavy. And we've even had City of Bright, which is a local, uh, they're, I think they're out of Lima. Mm -hmm. City of Bright's local. Uh, they come down and play four times a year. It's uh, two sisters on keyboards and their brother on the drums. So you don't, you know, we save the heavy metal for the Facebook page and for like if we do concerts outside of Sunday. Yeah. But, you know, we open our two minute countdown is Metallica for whom the bell tolls and then service will start. We open up in prayer. And then like this past Sunday, we had Frank Boyd Jr. out of Mansfield, Ohio, one of the best blues guitarists. And, uh, you know, it's just amazing. So the people come in to, to lead worship, you're talking about them being A bands or people that, that really know what they're doing with the music. Are they vetted through you? Do you you know for the fact that they're a Christian, they're going to lead people into worship? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, we have to vet them and listen. Well, first, I would start out with their demo, and mm -hmm. then I need to determine what they what they believe because we can't have anybody with false right. doctrine or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, in the early years, I didn't. I mean, I was new to yeah. all this, you know, and I I found out that one of the bands that had been playing at our church, they were fine at first, but then they converted over to universalism. And when I found that out, mm -hmm. we had, uh, hey, I'm sorry, but you can't play here anymore. Um, and a really big stink got slammed on mm -hmm. Facebook and all of this other stuff. But, you know, if you're going to call yourself the first heavy metal church of Christ and you're going to use the imagery we use and everything, you better be sound mm -hmm. doctrine or, you know, because yeah. people call us heretics all the time. I've been called a cult leader, everything that you can possibly think of. Well, people walk into your church if they, I mean, if they look different or if they've got a suit and tie on, you've been in this lifestyle, this heavy metal lifestyle. Somebody walks in with a suit. And tie. Are you going to judge them? Are you looking externally as some of these people come walking in? How, how do you, what's the difference between judging somebody like that and do those externals have to change as the internal changes? Well, there has been rare occasions where people have walked in in suits and our people have never done anything. Uh, they might feel uncomfortable because it's reverse when they sure, look around and reverse. see. And I, this is why I wore this today because I purposely dress like this every Sunday when I preach. I'm going to work, so this yeah. is my this is my <laughs> mechanics shirt. But I never want. So many times, you know, a lot of these churches, and forgive me, but a lot of churches out there have become upper middle class country clubs with the dockers and the button ups and, and everything like that. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you have a poor family come in that is not dressed well mm -hmm. and they might have clothes that were popular 10 years ago they're going to feel yeah. insecure so at least they can look up and say well man the pastor looks like a bum and he's <laughs> oh wow look at his arms <laughs> man oh wow, really this is great car, what's that so you don't look like a bum you look like you're ready to well hang hey, i'll do your oil change yeah. i've done a little bit of everything but do the do the i mean when somebody walks in and they're just fresh out of whatever iron maiden and do their externals change as their internal changes? Do you see that happen? I don't see that it has to. Mm -hmm. I mean... But does it? Um, sometimes. You, we had, had one guy come up, you know, he had his, both his ear pierced and, and something. Uh, I think he, he come up and he goes, man, for some reason I just, I don't feel like I have to have this, you know, image anymore. And I'm just, you know, I decided to take my sure. earrings out. But um, I... You don't it's have. Not, it's not a church that, that majors on the externals. No, because the Bible says okay. that we're mm -hmm. not supposed to judge right. by the outwardly appearance. Um, I know I look like I just got out of prison, you know. But I they don't like prison tasks. <laughs> those are professionals. <laughs> well, how do you know? You've been to prison. <laughs> Never mind. Oh yeah. Okay. Cover those arms up. But I'm serious. I mean, you know, you don't have to worry about your outwardly appearance. I mean, I know mm -hmm. people that'll tell me I'm going to hell because I've got a beard, and that. You know, don't tell the Amish that. Well, exactly. <laughs> and that's the kind of things that push people away. What does it matter if I wear a concert t-shirt to church on Sunday or if I wear a three-piece suit? The thing is, don't think your three-piece suit is doctrine or that it's going to save you yeah. or that it's doctrine. Uh, my cousin, Mike Gerald, who runs a, a pastor of a Free Will Baptist Church down in Kentucky, he said it best. He goes, a lot of Baptists love to wear their Sunday best to church on Sunday, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with mm -hmm. that. But don't ever look down on somebody that doesn't come in in a suit and don't think that that suit is doctrine mm -hmm. because it's not. Yeah. So what are you calling people to now? I mean, you've got, you've got this mix of, of people that are coming in. They love the church. They love what's going on inside the church. 
What are you calling them to outside the church? Hey, we're nothing but an outreach church, 100%. Uh, people ask me all the time, Pastor B, when are we getting our own building? I'm like, we don't want our own building. We're in a high school. Mm -hmm. We have wonderful rent. I mean, our pizza bus ministry alone runs sixteen to $20,000 a year. And if we had our own building, we couldn't afford that. Mm -hmm. I've already capped my salary. I'm not in this to get rich. Um, it disgusts me with pastors wanting $63 million planes because they don't want to set in a tube of demons up at 30 feet up in the air. And it's, no, I mean, we're an outreach church. That's what we're supposed mm -hmm. to be. And we focus everything we do is outside those doors to point to Jesus, right. feed the sick, clothe, or feed the hungry, clothe the poor. Um, that's what we do. There's a movement in our culture by some to raise a red flag when men are too competitive, too macho, or appear not sensitive enough, causing a lot of people to be offended. Well, the term's called toxic masculinity. I sat down with Walt Shepard, who's a regular contributor to our show, to see what his thoughts are. I mean, we talk about toxic masculinity. They're talking about, I don't know whether they're talking about guys driving four-wheel trucks and running around without their shirts on and playing country music. What they define as toxic masculinity. I, I don't know how they're, uh, how well, they're defining some well, what of this. Well, what they want to say, and I, I've read articles on, on their loose definitions of what toxic masculinity is. And uh, what they want to try to, to do is, is and, and there are some things that males can do that are toxic. We, I, that's true. That's sin. You know, they can be rude. Uh, they can be hateful. They can be spiteful. They can be violent. Uh, they can, uh, they can be, uh, uh, they can be dangerous. Okay. All the, these are things that are not necessarily bad on, uh, they're, they're sin, but it's not masculinity that's a problem. It's sin, sin. that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So it's really not a toxic masculinity. It's toxic males. And we have toxic females yeah. too. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, but, but when you look at, what a masculine man would do, yes, there's aggression, uh, yes, there's dominance, but there's humility, and there's love, and there's compassion, mm -hmm. and there's grace, and there's protection um, that, that should be in a spiritual masculine man. And I think that's what the, the feminists want. They want a spiritual masculine man, but calling a male toxic or masculinity toxic throws a whole, uh, uh, a, 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 whole, a whole characteristic that a male should be into a, in a, in a, in a quasm of confusion because I don't think mm -hmm. that the children growing up know really what a masculine male looks like. But, but they're, they're taking the, the aggression that is in all males and the, the desire to dominate and saying, don't do that, don't do that. Don't be you, competitive. Don't, don't be competitive, win. don't win. Um, and when you demonize that and you create a feminine male, this is the, this is the crazy thing. If you create a feminine male uh, in a society, by default, their counterpart, which is the female, is going to be affected and vice versa. If you, have a crea if you create a, a masculine female, the male is affected by her masculinity by wanting to be feminine. This is a repeat of history. I'm not saying anything new. Mm -hmm. Rome, Greece, you'll find there's always been a desire and, to go androgyny, yeah. right? Yeah. Where, where we're kind of mixing and you, you don't know if it's a male or a female and, and you can't tell the difference. And you see a lot of men today that have uh, feminine traits and you have m females today that are now becoming very masculine. This is an androgyny society and it's the tail end of a culture. It's, it's the tail end of, of when Greece was finished, when Rome was finished, and we're going rapidly into that, into that area where androgyny is becoming mm -hmm. the norm. Yeah, I, I know there, there was a uh, movement, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, where uh, a lot of people changed the name of God in the Bible to Sophia. They wanted a <laughs> female God. And, but, but God is always identified in the Bible as a he, even though we know that God is not gender. God, but, but male and female together, uh, we're in, in, in the image of, image of God. So why is he identified as wow, man, that, with that pronoun? Yeah, it's, it, it, boy, boy, you, you talk about this, okay? You, you have, okay, the, the religion behind it, the religion behind it is that this, this male God, okay, mm -hmm. uh, messed everything up in the Garden of Eden. The serpent, this is, this is Greek mythology, this is Gnostic teaching. Okay, I'm not, this is, you can research this. Mm -hmm. Uh, the serpent in the garden was the good person, was trying to say, hey, there's help here. And so they, they, they actually 
deified the serpent. The serpent. I, I made him as God. He's mm -hmm. okay. He's, he's trying to tell you what this mean God, this male God wants to do. And the backstory to it is that the male God through Sophia, okay, the female counterpart to himself into the abyss. And she's trying to, she's trying to communicate to the humanity through the knowledge of trees. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why you got people hugging, hugging trees, trees today. They're trying, and they really believe they're communi being communicated by Sophia uh, through um, through means of trees, right. and that's where the tree of the knowledge of good and mm. evil. That's that's what the serpent was trying. So behind the scenes of feminism and and Gnost is the Gnostic teachings that the male god, the patriarch, is is the male that needs to be destroyed, mm. and 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 Sophia is trying to bring right. wisdom. And she's referenced as her in the book of Proverbs. And, and Gnostic teachings will, will actually begin to unfold that, you know, she's coming back. And it's androgyny. Yeah. It, there's a lot to unpack when we start talking about this. <laughs> yeah. but, but thank you for being with us today. We, I know we've got people thinking again. <laughs> Hopefully Good. they'll go to the Go, go to, to the, the Bible. Go, go to, to the, the Bible. Word. Thank you very much. Would you like to help expand the reach of Viewpoint with Bob Lacey? Then sign in with your YouTube account and subscribe. Do the same on your favorite podcast app. By subscribing, rating, and sharing Viewpoint content, you will help this life-changing media show up on more search engines as popular and trending. If everyone watching right now would do that, Viewpoint would become more visible worldwide to online viewers in places that missionaries can't even reach. Thank you for helping us reach the world by sharing Viewpoint with Bob Lacey. This is where, on other programs, you'd be watching a commercial, but not on Viewpoint. If you've never supported TV44 before and enjoy Bob's interviews on Viewpoint, we encourage you to please support us today. Go to WTLW.com and click Donate. It's a normal thing for us to have a dream or a vision of what we want to do in our lives, but what happens when it's suddenly snapped away from us? Often we think we miss God's plan. Well, next I sit down with a man who went through this exact scenario, and it was quite a journey. What happens, what decisions do you make in your life when you know God's got a plan for your life, you're going that direction, and it gets turned upside down, how do you proceed on? Well, that's the, that's the story of Dr. Herman Williams, and he's with us today, and glad to have you here. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be able to share my story. But you did have a, you knew God had a plan for your life. You are raised in the church. Uh, you had this desire to become a doctor, and everything was going that way. Matter of fact, you were even in a residency. At the time, what, yes. happened, what, what happened to turn that upside down? Well, um, you know, I had some challenges getting on track, but I finally got on track. I was blessed. I got into a great medical school. Yeah, you went to Boston, got into an Boston University. Boston right? University, yeah. correct. Got into an incredibly difficult subspecialty, orthopedic surgery, and I just knew I was on my way. <laughs> and... Um, uh, as God works in mysterious ways, I joined an anesthesia uh, intramural basketball team. And you'll see the relevance there. <laughs> but uh, so I'm playing basketball with a bunch of anesthesia residents, and I had a cardiac arrest. And oh, my goodness. How, dropped how old were you at the time? I was 31 at the time. Wow. Um, so the beauty is anesthesiologists, they are the experts in resuscitation. <laughs> And um, after my wife uh, screamed at the top of her lungs that I had collapsed on the sidelines, um, everybody ran over and they started CPR immediately. And we now know that time to CPR after having a cardiac arrest is the key to having a successful resuscitation. I mean, it wasn't just a heart. Your, your heart had stopped. I mean, you were, that was it. Heart had stopped, pupils dilated, not breathing, slowly turning purple. And my buddies would later tell me, we, we didn't even think you were going to make it, but we just kept doing CPR. At 31 years old, and you tell this story in your book, Clear. Yes. Uh, and it's, it's a dynamic book. Uh, why did you name it Clear? Well, I named it Clear because that's what the EMTs say before they shock a person. They tell everybody clear. And what that means is don't anybody touch the, the body because when we shock this person, if you're touching him, you're going to get shocked too. <laughs> so I, I named the book Clear. 
And that's what they say. And that, and at the same time, that electronic, that electrical shock, and when they yell clear, that that really does give you that second chance. There's something new is starting. It really does. And Bob, let me just throw in one little other wrinkle. The first EMTs that arrived, when they said clear and everybody got out of the way and they put the defibrillators on me, the defibrillator was not working. Oh. And they had to resume CPR again until the fire department got there about three minutes later and their defibrillator finally worked. But they kept the heart pumping and kept the blood going. They, the, they the kept brain. doing CPR, yeah. So mm -hmm. what happens at that point? You, you wake up in the hospital and you think, wow, my life has just suddenly taken this huge uh, turn. What comes through your mind well, at that point? It's a good question. It, a lot of things ran through my mind. One of the things that you have after a cardiac arrest is short-term memory loss. So every five minutes, I would ask my wife, what happened? Oh. And it took me about a week to realize that I had had a life-threatening event and that I was in the medical ICU and I had basically everything had come to a standstill. So how do you, how do you go on from there? I mean, what, uh, you're in the middle of an orthopedic surgical residency, right? And you can't take yes. that up again. You, they, what do they di diagnose you with? So they diagnosed me with a rare heart condition called right ventricular dysplasia. And that is a condition where the muscle is replaced by fat and it makes it very difficult for the heart to conduct electrically the way it normally should. And that causes this bad arrhythmia. So first of all, again, I just outline many of the blessings as we go along. There just happened to be a clinical trial going on in Seattle at the time with what we all now know is the defibrillator, the implantable surgical wow. defibrillator. So I was one of the initial people in that trial. Uh, and um, a physician came in my room and said, you know, would you mind participating? This way you will always have an EMT in your chest every time you have a crazy rhythm. If it's life-threatening, this device will shock you. So you'll never have to worry about anyone calling 911. <laughs> yeah, but the, the, you don't have to worry about someone calling 911, but you, you, don't you walk around thinking, whoops, th this thing's going to gonna zap me again? That happened several times, didn't it? Um, if we just cut to the chase, I got shocked 50 times in the first six months of oh, having the device. My goodness. And again, it was, you go back, that was 28 years ago. That was when we didn't know what we know about medications now. That's when they started me on the lowest dose of an antiarrhythmic and we slowly ratcheted it up until we got it to the point where the medication was the treatment. Until we got there, the device was the treatment, which of course is not compatible with life, getting shocked every sure. no, it's not. You know, every week. Not compatible yeah. with, a, with a career in, in medicine either. I mean, no, no. as a surgeon, you, you really can't yes. go through life as a surgeon like that. So what? Where, where did God take it at this point? I mean, he, he's made a big change in your life. Yes. And you yes. found out that really this is, this is something God has, has planned for you. Right. So I had already taken a slight uh, diversion during medical school and gotten a master's in public health. And so I was already prepared for the business of health care. And what I decided to do is I was going to, uh, stop my residency uh, and go on. And, and again, it just didn't make sense to me to put my patients in a liability situation where I'm doing surgery and I get shocked. Yeah. It, just, it just was not compatible with that career. So I went back to business school. That gave me another two years to recover physically. And that's where I found my new mm -hmm. career, which was essentially a uh, healthcare uh, consulting, uh, and I started uh, with an organization uh, which is no longer around, but Arthur Anderson was one of the big four at that time, and I launched my career, and that led to a beautiful, fruitful career as a chief medical officer for the past 18 years. So how have you seen God use that now? I mean, do you, you look back and think, wow, he's, he's really got me where I belong? I, I think so. You know, the, the book talks about, 
you know, I grew up in Southern California, you know, stars and and everybody, you know, wanting to be a movie star or wanting to be somebody important. And I, my superficial goal was I was going to be the best orthopedic surgeon and I was going to go back and I was going to be the team doctor for the L.A. Lakers. That was my <laughs> my goal. And I realized how superficial that was. And God laid out a plan for me where now I was the chief medical officer over 18 hospitals in 13 states, managing the health care of so many more people and having a much more powerful impact on delivering quality care. And that just, you know, that initial dream that I had pales in comparison to where God has put me now. And that's why the tagline on the book is, of course, the book is called Clear, but the tagline is living the life you didn't dream of. Because I never dreamed that I'd be in a position of having to influence so many lives uh, in a positive way with God's vision and God's love. Well, it ends up being a dream career now. (laughs) Yes, what, what, exactly. can you, what can you tell someone who really is in the middle of that, especially a young person? You were a very young person at the time, 31 years old. Yes. Your whole life's ahead of you, a, a wonderful career as an orthopedic surgeon, big dream. What can you tell someone who who's, feels like that's been ripped up out of their life or turned upside down? What can you tell them? Um, there are several messages in the book, but I'll just name three. Mm-hmm. Number one, believe in something bigger than you. And I was speaking to, of course, Christians, but I was also speaking to anybody who understands that we are, you know, we are obviously governed by something more powerful than us. And by that, I mean, there is a plan. Mm -hmm. Be patient. There is a plan. And for me, I knew that God had a plan. I knew that I was not going to go through all this training and all this hard work and end up uh, debilitated. Uh, as I was. So that's number one. Number two is you got to have loved ones around you support you. And my wife is just, my wife is an angel living here on earth amongst us. I mean, I cannot tell you, uh, and you're probably familiar with this if you have a, someone who's been sick or you have a family member, is that everything you go through, that partner goes through. So every time I got shocked, she got shocked. So she went through all that, but still managed to give me encouragement and tell me it's going to be better. It's going to get better. It's going to get better. And then lastly, my my third point is, is that you got to be resilient and just perseverance will always overcome, you know, um, adversity. So you just got to hang in there and persevere. Persevere. Well, the name of the book is Clear, Living a Life You Didn't Dream Of. Doctor, where can, where can they pick it up? They can get it on uh, Amazon. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's also available uh, uh, at many of the uh, other bookstores online. I have a website, clearlivingthedream.com. You can also order the book there. I appreciate you joining me today. Please share our interviews on YouTube. Also, you can find Viewpoint interviews on iTunes and anywhere you listen to a podcast. I'm Bob Placey. Thanks for joining me today. Remember, you can share all the Viewpoint interviews you've seen today online at YouTube. And you can listen to the Viewpoint podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and anywhere you can listen to a podcast.